Very good morning, everyone. Welcome on the 14th day of this two week advanced online professional training program on utilization of nanomaterials and instrumental techniques for energy applications. We are into the last phase of this journey into the world of nanomaterials and advanced instrumentation. Uh, and I hope that this has proved to be fruitful to you all till now. Today, we welcome our technical speaker of the day, Professor Paresh Ji Kale, National Institute of Technology, Rao Kela. He'll deliver two sessions on silicon nanostructures for solar cells and hydrogen storage. So let me take this opportunity to introduce our speaker to the audience. Currently, Professor Paresh Ji Kale is working as an assistant professor at the National Institute of Technology, NIT Rao Kela, India. He received his PhD degree in energy system engineering from the IIT Bombay, Mumbai in 2013. His research interests cover nanomaterial synthesis, including the quantum dots, nanowires, porous silicon, and its application for the solar photovoltaics, batteries, sensors, and hydrogen storage. He has two patents in several technical publications in reputed international journals, Professor Kali has authored and co-authored multiple peer-reviewed scientific papers, presented work at many national and international conferences, and he, his contributions have acclaimed recognition from honorable subject experts around the world. He is also actively associated with different societies and academies. His uh, academic career is decorated with several reputed awards and fundings. He has undertaken and completed several government-sponsored proje projects and he's an active reviewer of reputed international journals like uh, Renewable Energy, Journal of Cleaner Production, Solar Energy Materials and Solar Cells, Analytica, Renewable Energy, Nano Micro Small, and so many others. Sir, so, on the behalf of Gyan Bihar University, I welcome you. And now I hand over this session to you for your technical session. Yeah, thank you, Professor Srivastava, and uh, thank you, Professor Jain, uh, for first of all inviting me to deliver this lecture. So I'm very much overwhelmed for that, and also thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I hope I'm uh, absolutely audible, and uh, let me share the screen uh, with you uh, for my presentation. Yes, sir, you are audible, sir. Yeah, so is the uh, shared screen visible? Yes, sir, it is visible now. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so, so uh, myself, Professor uh, Paresh, and uh, uh, currently I'm working uh, at NIT Raoulkela, as I've said, but also I am associated with one of the national mission uh, run by IIT Bombay, DST IIT Bombay Energy Storage Platform on Hydrogen. So whatever work I'm going to present today will be uh, uh, somewhat related to that as well. Of course, you must have heard uh, Professor Pratibha Sharma, who is the PI for this particular uh, national mission project. So today, what I'm going to show, uh, rather talk is uh, silicon nanostructures for uh, the solar cells uh, in the first half. And in the second half uh, afternoon session, I'll be talking about the hydrogen storage uh, applications uh, uh, for, for the same silicon nanostructures. Of course, um, as far as, as uh, at NIT Raudkela is concerned, uh, currently, we are majorly into the material synthesis and uh, what we are expecting in next two to three years, we will be starting actually the applications. Uh, what I mean is uh, making certain devices and also uh, to use these uh, materials for uh, storage like hydrogen and uh, the battery anodes. So today what I'm going to present is something like this. So I will start about uh, introducing silicon. Of course, as this is a workshop and not just a lecture. So what I've done is a mixture of uh, everything, what, what we research, uh, what we have published so far, uh, what others have published, what are the possibilities in this particular area. And of course, just a pinch of salt of a uh, little, uh, little bit of theory. Uh, so I, uh, of course, I have been given two hours, so I don't know how much uh, this uh, 60, 70 slides are going to stretch, uh, stretch about, uh, but let us, uh, I'll, I'll try to wind up in somewhat about two hours. So then uh, the, coming to the major point, why we require several silicon nanostructures, I'll be talking about four uh, nanostructures, and then I will uh, elaborate its use 
uh, after after the synthesis, I elaborate its use in uh, the first one is the solar photovoltaics and then in uh, majorly the hydrogen storage. So to start with, I'll, I'll, I'll go through these initial slides very quickly, very introductory slides. So why silicon? We, we all know silicon is one of the abundant materials which is having the diamond cubic uh, crystal structures. Lattice constant is uh, 5.3, 4.3 angstroms. And it has got a, a unit cell containing eight and the valency of about four. Uh, so this is the crystal structure, but most importantly, as far as application is concerned, it is popular due to its availability. It is one of the already established material in the electronics industry. Uh, so because it is abundantly available, it is uh, what we call just give me a second yeah uh, so it is established uh, material for uh, the microelectronics industries it is non hazardous it doesn't have any detrimental effect and then uh, whatever the progress is made it is compatible with the micro technology and uh, we have generated knowledge over the decades However, whenever I'm talking about the new uh, applications, there are certain problems associated with silicon. And in fact, that was the reason why people moved away from silicon when they talked about uh, the uh, newer applications in last decade or two. So first one is the cost of the material. So the here normally the substrate which we require in solar PV, let us say first generation solar PV is very thicker. Uh, Thus, the electricity cost, the per unit cost also increases. Second thing is silicon in bulk, it has got a fixed band up of 1.1 electron volt. And our uh, solar spectrum is uh, quite wide for from, uh, let us say, visible is from 400 to uh, 700 or so. So it, it, it with this fixed band gap, it cannot capture the whole uh, solar spectrum. And of course, then we are losing uh, many photons. And as far as solar PV is concerned, we are losing the, that is not losing the efficiency, but in fact, it is the underutilization of the resources. Uh, when we come for hydrogen storage, as far as bulk silicon is concerned, uh, it, it doesn't have a large uh, surface area, very small surface area. And of course, we know that for hydrogen storage, we require uh, a good reactive surface which can hold the hydrogen. Thus, the area should be higher. And for that, we require surface modifications, uh, surface area increasing, as well as making the surface area suitable to accept more uh, hydrogen. So uh, the morphology, what we have to uh, check, uh, there, uh, now, as far as battery applications is concerned, low surface area is one problem. Second problem is the volume expansion with the other materials. So, for example, if you take uh, uh, the lithium, so there is a uh, there, there is a volume expansion happening there, and it cannot accommodate it. But whereas when we come to silicon, it has got larger uh, what you say uh, volumetric density, and it can also uh, expand. Uh, so it can sustain the stresses happening during the charging and discharging. And apart from that, there is one small proper problem is the low electrical conductivity for silicon. So normally that is adjusted by the doping, but uh, then again, that doping has to be optimized. If it is low, the conductivity is low. If it is too high, then uh, the recombination will be very higher. So, so there is no uh, much of the, what you say, flexibility we have got over there. So uh, when we talk about now uh, increasing the utility of silicon, one way remains is to go towards the nanotechnology to decrease the size of uh, the silicon itself. So when we are trying to engineer this uh, matter, when we are moving from bulk silicon towards the uh, what you call uh, nano, uh, nano domain, we are talking about something below 100 nanometers. And then, uh, so this below 100 nanometer is good for uh, good for the storage applications. But when it is a device application, solar photovoltaics is concerned. We uh, the problem is the band gap, as I've said. So we need band gap engineering, and this happens below the bore uh, radius, which is roughly around six nanometer. So if we can decrease the particle size below six, uh, we can tune that band gap. Of course, I'm going to talk, talk in detail when we talk uh, uh, in the in the solar PV section about this. So uh, at, at, as I've said, at, at NIT, we are majorly into the synthesis of uh, various nanostructures as of now. So what we do is uh, we, we, we have various uh, derivatives of silicon, uh, silicon 
first one, the simplest one is the silicon, porous silicon used for layer transfer process, anti-reflection coating, of course, hydrogen sensors and gas sensors, as well as biosensors, although that is not our topic today. Uh, second thing is the silicon uh, quantum dots. That is the part of one way uh, to achieve uh, the higher efficiency at lower cost under the third generation photovoltaics and of course, hydrogen storage. Then porous silicon nanowires. These are also used for uh, the third generation photovoltaics uh, in, in, in various forms, including the anti-reflection coating in battery and hydrogen storage that is the uh, uh, application for everything. Then we have got a restructured porous silicon. So here, whatever porous silicon we have obtained, we are going to uh, we are going to change its morphology using sintering, and this is very much useful for layer transfer process, which is again a part of uh, first generation uh, photovoltaics only. And then uh, these layers, as these are freestanding, and of course uh, a lot of modification can be done on that. Uh, so choosing a particular modification, we can use it for these sensors application. So uh, now initially I'll talk about the synthesis of uh, these four structures to start with uh, the porous silicon, the easiest one. So simply we take a silicon substrate and we, uh, we, we uh, use anodization current under uh, electrolytes present under the presence of electrolyte. And then what we get, get is the uh, thin film structure. So here you can see all these uh, small pores are generated. Of course, they are not homogeneous. Again, uh, so many conditions are there uh, on which uh, this depends. Uh, of course, uh, anodization is uh, is one of the major application, one of the major way to produce porous silicon. However, there are so many approaches which can be divided into top down or bottom up uh, approaches. Uh, so uh, here uh, the uh, as as anodization. Uh, uh, this technique is used, the continuous production is possible. It means uh, first I will make a layer porous, I can lift it off, I can make it freestanding and then whatever the substrate remains, I can reuse it. So the next uh, uh, layer, next to next layer and I can continuously use the same substrate. So reuse is very much uh, easy. Now, as far as this anodization process is concerned, uh, as I've said, it is in electrolyte. Uh, electrolyte is HF plus acetic acid or HF plus uh, ethanol. Uh, uh, depending upon suitability and availabilities. Uh, so this SI reacts with the HF. So HF is basically the e chunk here and it takes away uh, takes away the silicon and releases hydrogen simultaneously. And when it takes away silicon, that this, that is where you see uh, the pores. And this, uh, the bottom picture, that is the cross-section image of the porous silicon where you can see the tree-like structure is formed. But of course, this is one kind of uh, pore structure we have. And this, you can see how much control we can achieve. So uh, the reactions, uh, the porous silicon formation stops immediately when we stop the reaction. And that's why you see silicon over here. So you can see how much uh, change we are making and we can, uh, we, we can control these uh, uh, parameters as, as we want. So this is what exactly happens inside a porous silicon, generate, uh, porous silicon generator setup. Uh, for this uh, process anodization, we require a constant color current uh, DC power supply, uh, and that would be fed through uh, the uh, fed to the uh, fed to the set uh, setup. Uh, and uh, we can use two inch, four inch substrates uh, depending upon again uh, how we manufacture our uh, setup. So as I've said, there are a few properties we should look for, output properties of porous silicon. One is the thickness, that is a time control parameter. Uh, so anodization time, if we increase, thickness increases. Porosity is the current control parameter, how much current density we choose. And then we have got porous pore size distribution, which is a complex parameter depending upon so many things. And then film lift off is possible. So either we can keep it undetached or we can lift it off. Again, depending upon our, our application, whether we want the silicon substrate to remain there with uh, porous silicon or not. So if we try to find out the various parameters affecting these three output parameters, uh, the things are like current density, anodization time, HF concentration, and uh, the wafer, uh, of course, doping, the resistivity, the type of doping, everything, uh, everything uh, affects over here, affects to the porosity, each rate, and the thickness. So point is, uh, depending upon what application you are seeking, you have to optimize this. So for example, porosity, you can vary from 10% to about 80, 85%, up to 90% even. 
So of course, ninety percent means very brittle film, and whereas ten percent it means very low porosity. So uh, uh, suppose uh, you want about thirty percent uh, film for uh, say uh, for a low porosity application, then you have to adjust the parameter. The thickness again you have to adjust the uh, adjust the time. Uh, so whether it is a two micrometer film or twenty or fifty micrometer film. Uh, again, now as far as film lithography is concerned, uh, the problem is uh, uh, if if you continue this process just for one film uh, uh, for a prolonged time, uh, the one step separation occurs, and then there is an upper limit for how much thickness uh, you can achieve. But it is of course uh, far uh, higher as compared to whatever application uh, we are thinking and corresponding thickness. Now, as far as quantum dots is concerned, that is a very uh, peculiar concept of band gap engineering. So here it exhibits some phenomena called as quantum confinement defect, and that is absolutely a material dependent property. So as I've said, uh, normally for bulk silicon, we are we cannot change the properties. These these are fixed for and that, for that matter, we cannot change it for any bulk uh, uh, bulk material. But then, interestingly, these semiconductor materials, whenever we uh, decrease the size, uh, uh, small enough than the bore's radius, it changes its uh, it changes its properties, and this phenomena results from the electron and holes uh, be being squeezed into a small di uh, small uh, dimensions and that is uh, equivalent or lower than the exciton bore radius so in the diagram you can see that uh, whenever the particle size that is the horizontal uh, axis what we have so suppose we we decrease this uh, uh, particle size, the band gap. So uh, earlier it was this silicon that was 1.1. Now you have got a uh, got an increased band gap of up to uh, two electron uh, two electron volt uh, two electron volt or so. Now that all depends on what is the uh, size that 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 you are doing. So uh, to realize or to use these uh, quantum dots, uh, normally it is uh, embedded into some other insulating material. So you can see that this uh, band gap, uh, this is the largest band gap, large band gap we have. So that will be coming from some uh, insulating material. Uh, the famous one is uh, silicon dioxide or uh, Si3N4 or even silicon carboid. Again, depending upon uh, you know uh, what is the effective band gap you require. So this quantum dot synthesis again you can use top down or bottom up approaches. Uh, the famous approaches are uh, the uh, top down approaches where. Uh, Sorry, bottom-up approaches where you are using uh, various chemical vapor depositions or sputtering or ion implantation. Mechanical billing is a uh, top-down approach. So he, this now once you can tune the band gap, you can use it for the multi-junction solar cell, which we'll talk later. Uh, so how we do it? Uh, uh, this is our method. What we have patented this silicon wafer. You can take make the porous silicon. So here you can see. You know, freestanding film of uh, the porous silicon. This is about 20 micrometer thin, and uh, of course, it has got pores. Uh, you can't see it because these are of uh, 20 to 100 nanometer or so. So it can be monolayer, it can be multilayer. Multilayer means uh, you are varying the porosity. Okay, so alternate where a porosity you can have. So for example, 30, 50, 30, 50, and, and it, it, it will repeat and it will have such a multiple layers. And then when we sonicate this. Uh, we get uh, silicon nanoparticles and uh, depending upon the time of sonication we can reduce the um, uh, reduce the particle size so it is moreover like a mechanical milling but in, in this is in presence of uh, the uh, so, uh, the ultra uh, ultra sonicating waves and then we get silicon nanopowder we can filter it and we can get uh, a uniform pore size distribution here and this is the tm micrograph of uh, uh, the porous silicon now you can see the problem is the agglomeration so here you can see those are agglomerated. So you have to have some surface treatment over here. Second, pro, second point is uh, this uh, pore silicon. Of course, there are so many theories about this. Pore silicon in itself also exhibits some quantum confinement. But unfortunately, as uh, these these uh, particles are not say, uh, say, separate or discrete, uh, the using it in in the uh, in the photovoltaics would be a bit difficult. So that's why we have to separate them. So basically, ultrasonication is breaking these particles, and uh, as they have uh, quantum dots embedded into it, uh, 
uh, the smaller particles uh, effect uh, the effect of this quantum dot gets enhanced uh, enhanced uh, another form is the silicon nanowires which you must have heard about so these are one dimensional uh, semiconductors quantum dots we think it as uh, 3d or zero dimensional whatever way you look at it it's a, these are the spheres okay so these are unidimensional so you can see this is the substrate that we have and then we grow the nanowires uh, perpendicular to uh, this now uh, again silicon is an indirect band gap and uh, all these porous silicon quantum dots or nanowires all are uh, uh, all become uh, direct band gap semiconductors and uh, of course uh, direct band gap means uh, you, you don't require photon and phonon for the activation and thus you are uh, uh, you are saving the energy which which ultimately uh, increases your efficiency now in nanowires as well we have higher surface area compared to the bulk silicon and these nanowires can be again uh, formed by various methods established methods cvds uh, vapor liquids uh, solid uh, solutions laser ablation molecular beam epitaxy and the method what we follow is the simplest one it is a metal assisted chemical etching or in short it is called as the base technique so where we take substrate we have again electrolyte now uh, in a sense this is a modified method of the porous silicon so here we uh, we coat uh, the uh, silicon substrate with agno3 now these agno3 uh, these small particles uh, in, in a simple sense provides a low resistivity path so the current is diverted there and we know that higher the current higher will be the itching so it localizes the itching and uh, as this uh, uh, itching starts uh, the uh, the uh, ag particles goes down and it it provides a path uh, for uh, the itching so it you have you are you are digging okay you are, you, you leave some part uh, of of the wafer uh, unitched and that forms basically the nanowires so these ag particles of course we don't want so we can clean it with hno3 and h2 solutions and then uh, we get the nanowires. Of course, that complete removal of uh, Ag particles is not possible. Now, again, uh, important part in uh, this uh, is again the morphology control, where we have to control length, diameter, and the orientation of this. Length is uh, uh, is the most important parameter for us, and uh, again, it depends on what application what we are choosing. In a way, this mesh is a very simple and low cost processing. And of course, uh, we prefer the only rather costly part here is the metal particles what we use. We can use several metal particles, uh, platinum uh, and gold are costly uh, and copper and nickel, they are cheaper, but then um, the problem with that, they are the, they, they cause uh, what we call deep traps. Uh, so deep traps is uh, the defects sitting at exactly in mid of the band gap of silicon, uh, somewhere around 0.57 or something. So uh, that is very detrimental if we are going to uh, do any uh, any uh, photovoltaic applications. So again, uh, the choice of the material, metal particles, will depend on uh, on on what application you are you are choosing. Uh, so uh, in a way, the compromise is the AgNO3. Now the problem with still there is one small problem with the nanowires that the surface area is not that high. Of course, it is much higher as compared to the bulk silicon. However, then uh, what we found out that uh, we can make this silicon nanowire as porous. So uh, the surface area will increase. So here you can see, uh, again, uh, you can see the small nanoparticles embedded inside the nano, inside this uh, porous silicon nanowires. And later I will show you the better picture. Uh, so this uh, nanowires, it has got a pore shell structure, uh, pore shell structure, and uh, you can see the porosity in that, in that nanowire uh, itself. Again, it's a direct band gap semiconductor. This we are targeting specially for uh, the anode in the batteries and uh, the hydrogen storage. So uh, uh, now how, what is the difference between the two as far as fabrication is concerned? So recently we reported uh, uh, multiple ways of doing it. So either we can use the mesh directly on the clean substrate or we can do the anodization, make the porous silicon first 
and then we can go for uh, then we can go for uh, the uh, two techniques uh, m1 and m2 so m1 is uh, this particular one i am not going through the algorithm so you get the four combinations uh, when you are going with two types of substrate and two types of uh, uh, two types of uh, what you say the methods so uh, what we found out after uh, after analyzing these is these four is uh, the first two methods the nanowires are not really forming uh, and uh, in in second method uh, we get instead we get uh, hpl lpl high porosity and low porosity layer uh, uh, layer and only in uh, the with, with method 2 we are getting the nanowires and the porous silicon nanowires and of course it depends on what is the substrate that we are using so uh, uh, when we are using silicon as a substrate we get silicon nanowire Uh, sorry and when we use porous silicon substrate we get porous silicon nanowire so of course you can understand that for porous silicon nanowire whatever the parameters controlling the porous silicon will ultimately uh, affect the your final product that is the porous silicon nanowire uh, as well so this is the whole what you call uh, 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 the whole whole picture over here so you can start with the cleaned wafer so i have given the uh, what you say uh, uh, the um, characteristics of these wafers uh, properties of these wafers uh, and certain other numbers as well what we use exactly for the methods which are reported in our papers uh, so with silicon wafer if you make anodization and uh, you can lift up you get porous silicon film so here if you come from this uh, you know after forming porous silicon and when you carry carry uh, uh, mess you get porous silicon if you directly come from silicon you get the silicon nanowire and uh, once you get this uh, when 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 you get this porous silicon films either in uh, free standing form or in the bounded form you can uh, you can use it for the uh, for your application and as i have said we can reuse the substrate so uh, when we remove this uh, 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 film we uh, we have this substrate and that again we clean the substrate we remove the whatever the you know small these these parts chunks of the porous silicon whatever uh, are remaining we remove it and the same uh, what you say same uh, substrate can be used you can see some patches over here right green and of course if it is visible on your screen green uh, reddish brownish or something it is because the surface is now uh, not even because the single solid uh, single solid wafer so you can check here these are the boundary at boundary it is absolutely shiny surface but inside where we have formed porous silicon uh, it is it is not that so shiny it is because the surface uh, the, uh, now your surface roughness has changed and does the does the does the reflection but uh, we have found out that uh, the surface roughness is not that much and uh, if we keep on removing such a films continuously uh, we still get uniform roughness about 6 nanometers or so of course it is not as good as the solid uh, single solid so solid polished one now as far as uh, some hydrogen applications is concerned these are the six uh, different samples what we have correct uh, what we have created even we have changed the resistivity we have changed the methods and of course uh, the method for formation of porous silicon is already optimized and the numbers i have given to you here so the point is there are various fabrication fabrication parameters to you know play with and it all comes down to how you are tuning your parameters how you are optimizing uh, these parameters so these are the acm micrographs of uh, the three porous silicon nanowires and then the porous silicon nanowires so uh, so as i have already explained the various things uh, so ultimately what matters is uh, the porosity uh, in and surface area in case of porous silicon nanowire uh, so that can be also extended if you extend the length and in normal silicon nanowire when you are using it for let us say solar applications normally we will see that the length plays uh, important role longer length would be better whereas diameter should be uh, should be small okay so uh, thickness and other uh, parameters porosity surface area should uh, should be controlled and normally uh, the major contributing parameter here is the anodization time and the anodization current density 
Now we did some FEM analysis for all the four combinations, and uh, uh, in in first we got some nanowires, but of the small lens uh, uh, for, for, with with M1 and with M uh, this M1 and porous silicon we got two alternate layer, low porous silicon layer and high porous silicon layer. Uh, so this is the schematic which I, I can show it to you. And of course, what happens is if we prolong uh, this particular, uh, you know, in, in uh, for this method, if we prolong the anodization time, the high porosity layer, because now the surface area is too high, uh, it, it, it dissolves into the electrolyte uh, because the itching rate uh, increases so, uh, so fast because of the area, uh, uh, we lose, uh, rather uh, we lose, um, we lose the uh, porous silicon, uh, whatever we have formed. So ultimately, we found out that the uh, substrate, either silicon or porous silicon plus method two, is the best method for us for any application. And also, uh, these uh, uh, these formations, especially when we are using mess, this is also uh, what you say uh, sensitive to the temperature. Uh, so we have optimized that about 45 degrees Celsius is the temperature uh, usable for getting the uh, getting the good lens. Uh, so here I am I am listing that. Uh, so you can see as we increase the temperature, the uh, average length of the uh, average length of the uh, silicon nanowire goes on decreasing. So if we are to keep uh, the uh, nanowires at longer length, we have to have about 45 degrees Celsius or so where we can control the temperature easily. Now, this is, these are the TEM uh, micrographs of uh, the nanocrystals. So you can see here the porous silicon uh, nanowire, and then it has got small quantum dots and whatever the dark patches you see, these black uh, patches, whenever we are expanding, we get uh, the quantum dots. So the length of uh, here in this case, it is about 3.44 micrometers and uh, the Another, uh, what, what you say, uh, uh, another peculiarity of this uh, uh, porous silicon nanowire is that it, it, it is a poor shell structure. And uh, it means in, inside, wherever it is dominated by the uh, silicon condom dots, that is more of a crystalline, somewhere around 70 to 80% crystallinity, whereas the outside uh, part, the shell is, uh, is amorphous in nature. And that is because this is the area which is exposed to the itching. So etching, as I've shown in porous silicon, it is only the vertical etching perpendicular to the substrate. But in case of porous silicon, we get both types of etching perpendicular as well as the parallel etching. So the diameter what we got is somewhere around 120 nanometer or so. Uh, so of course, uh, right now we have optimized length only, but soon we will be optimizing the uh, optimizing the uh, diameter uh, as well. Apart from that, you can also see that uh, there is a lot of AG that is from AGNO3 is also remanent. Uh, we have published recently uh, a paper in Nature to remove this AG by sintering, but that's a very different topic as of now. Uh, so what we found out that this AG is not only problematic uh, in a device, but it is also problematic that it, it eaches on the sidewall as well. Of course, it is good for porous silicon but not for the nanowires. So uh, the uh, various, uh, uh, what you say, uh, properties are uh, revealed here, uh, including the crystallinity, uh, including the uh, remnants from the, uh, uh, from the uh, EDS patterns, and then the size of the quantum dots. Apart from that, as I have said, we also need a roughness to state, uh, roughness to find out. Uh, uh, there are two types of uh, scanning probe microscopy. One is tunneling microscopy, which is normally used for the manipulation of the material. And the other one, AFM, atomic force microscopy, is, uh, is used for finding out uh, the various surface parameters, which is based on Hooke's law, which determines the force uh, whatever the uh, so there there is a, a small uh, uh, cantilever attached to a spring and that tip of uh, uh, the tip of AFM that goes on uh, what you say scanning uh, the uh, surface of uh, surface of the material and depending upon how it uh, undulates the forces change and this force is captured by uh, some sensor and that uh, so it is indirectly the force represents what is the surface roughness over here. So this is the schematic what you have. Uh, and of course, there are various types, uh, uh, contact mode, non-contact mode. Uh, but in general, what we have is this 
important parts there is a detector there is a feedback loop for uh, scanning the motion and then the cantilever deflections that is actually going to map the surface uh, topography so from this afm we are going to get so many parameters which tells about not only the surface roughness but what is the nature of this surface so we normally get average surface roughness rms surface roughness but with this uh, and apart from that we get skewness parameters so this is the symmetry of variation now this symmetry is important for uh, silicon nanowires so suppose uh, a silicon nanowire is exactly perpendicular then your skewness will be zero if it is towards left it will be negative it, if it is towards right it will be positive or vice versa so it is going to uh, check that symmetry the kurtosis factor that is going to measure the distribution of the spikes above and below the mean line so you can find out what is the average length of uh, uh, these pumpy structures over here uh, so this will tell us the type of the structure that we have so if that index is greater than three, three for example it is a spiky structure uh, you will have very elongated structure when it is less than three uh, there are kind of hills so bumpy uh, structure and then for three it is a very random surface means mixture of both spiky as well as bumpy then we can also uh, do certain analysis from RQ by I, which gives us the aspirated distribution. Normally, it should be between 1.25 to 1.31. So uh, these are some of the pictures for the different six samples uh, I, have, I, have, uh, I have shown or I have discussed uh, earlier. And you can see here that uh, whenever, uh, whenever there is a each, so S1 and S4, these are the porous silicon sample. Then we have got silicon nanowire. And last one is the uh, porous silicon uh, nanowire samples. Uh, so uh, from the RQ by RA, moreover, it is, as I've said, it is around 1.25. But whereas RKU, uh, that is the kurtosis, that changes. And that is what tells us uh, about, the, uh, about, about the structures over here. And what we found out that the surface roughness, of course, as expected, is much higher in porous silicon nanowire as compared to silicon nanowire compared to the porous silicon. Now, the last, uh, uh, what you say, uh, restructured por porous silicon, uh, the fourth, uh, what you say, derived material. Here, restructure means porous silicon film obtained undergoes sintering. And this sintering is uh, to, uh, what you say, uh, to treat the material somewhere in between 800 to 1200 degrees Celsius, then only the effect is seen. And in schematic, you can see that uh, the, there are small pores, let us say, diameters of D1 and D2. D1 are small pores, let us say, and D2 are uh, larger pores uh, or something like that. Then what happens is, depending upon your pore size, the uh, two pore either uh, merges to become a large pore or uh, the two pore vanishes to become a smooth surface during the sintering. And then after sintering, uh, the small, uh, small pores are gone, whereas you get only the larger uh, pores, D3, let us say, which are larger than, uh, let us say, D, D1 and D2. So you can see here, here the porous silic, uh, this pore formation is just started. Okay, and then you can see very small pores are there. So, so many small pores of various sizes are there. But ultimately, when you when you uh, when you uh, uh, center it, you you get the largest pore is somewhere around two micrometer, and you can see the rest of the surface is absolutely smooth. There is no uh, no uh, what you say uh, pores remaining there. Now, this again depends on so many parameters. It, it, it is the starting structure what you have. I mean, what is the morphology of the porous silicon? Then at what temperature you are sintering? How, uh, for how much time you are uh, keeping that at, at, at that elevated temperature? And uh, what is the gas that you use? Uh, nitrogen is the cheaper gas, but then uh, nitrogen causes uh, some problems. Rather, restructuring is not uh, uniform and proper. So the best one reported till date is uh, the mixture of nitrogen and uh, the argon gas. So here, nitrogen more or uh, works as a carrier gas. So what it does, uh, so why we are going for this? Because, uh, see, you might ask that why we cannot just produce two, uh, produce a porous silicon with a two micrometer pore. Yes, you can, but then you won't get such a smooth surface. So uh, that is going to create the problems for the optical properties, uh, the surface recombinations and everything. So uh, this is going to improve the optical properties and the conductivity, whereas uh, it, it is going to passivate the surface. 
it is going to reduce the various defects present on the surface and inside the material uh, material as well okay so uh, uh, depending upon where we need this and especially in solar photovoltaics we we don't want uh, such a defects however we need uh, what you say such a film for certain applications which i talk about later so we we require restructured porous silicon film in that so that was the first part of uh, the three parts and uh, that was the introduction for uh, what uh, uh, what uh, the nanostructures we are synthesizing and what, what, what are their characteristics and everything. Now we can start talking about the applications and the first one we have got is the silicon for solar photovoltaics. Now I will tell you the first I will tell you the importance of this uh, material. Why we are talking about material uh, when it is an electronic device, right? Of course, long back Thomas Edison said that we are going to make electricity so cheaper that only the rich will burn the candles, right? But when the rich are going to burn the candles, when the rate of the electricity goes down well below and it becomes so cheap. And in 2016, then the uh, minister said that uh, currently we are talking about renewables and everything, right? So renewable main problem was the cost of the electricity. So at that time, the solar bid received by NTCP, uh, this was solar thermal, of course, uh, uh, was about 4.63 rupees per unit. Still, it was pretty high uh, compared to the con uh, compared to the electricity by the conventional uh, ones. So that reduced to 2.6 rupees just in four years, somewhere around 2019-20. And the latest rate, if you see, the price is well below 2.44 rupees per unit price. So this means we are towards achieving the grid parity in this case. So how this is possible, how these rates are coming down, especially in these last five, six years or so. So for that, we have to look for what are the contributory, contributory parameters for that. And in that case, we have to find out uh, what is the total uh, cost of the project and uh, what uh, parameters, uh, sorry, what, what are the particulars uh, which contributes to the most. And you can find out that there are so many other parameters, cost, uh, civil work, labor, um, electrical units and whatnot. They hardly contribute anything. The major parameter is the models itself. Okay, and that is constituting about 62% of the total cost. Okay, so suppose we have to bring down the cost uh, of course, uh, all other costs, you can see that they are going to increase. So what we can do is we can decrease the, uh, decrease the panel cost by two ways. Either we can increase the efficiency or we can decrease the material cost itself. So people have done the sensitivity analysis of various parameters over here. So on y-axis, you can see the uh, model cost sensitivity, whereas uh, what is the savings available? So of course, you have to find out those parameters and concentrate on those parameters, which will be uh, saving uh, more and uh, which are more sensitive as well. So you can see the parameters like labor and then other model cost uh, parameters, they are very, you know, saving lesser and uh, they don't save much as well. Uh, sensitivity means here, how much a model cost is going to reduce if I'm going to increase that particular variable or decrease that particular variable. Uh, so yield is quite sensitive, but it is uh, not, you know, it is not saving a lot of cost. So what we have is this efficiency and the silicon feedstock, rather that is the material in this case. So if we can concentrate on that, so increase the efficiency and decrease the silicon uh, material uh, used itself, then we are going to increase, uh, reduce the uh, per unit cost of this. So Martin Green long back gave this particular, uh, particular graph. So one problem is the single limit band gap. It is also called a shock lake laser limit, which is somewhere around 31% for a single junction solar cell. And uh, there is a thermodynamic limit so that we never can uh, surpass somewhere around 81%. Band is because it depends on the material as well. So uh, the point is uh, the first generation solar cell is, uh, is here. So the cost is high, efficiency is low. 
then we went for second generation which was a thin film solar cells the cost was definitely decreased but then efficiency was not great so what he proposed was we have to go for a third generation solar cell where the efficiency has to be higher however the cost can be in between the first and second generation solar cells so thus we can reduce the uh, reduce the per unit cost to somewhere uh, you know one tenth of uh, one tenth or lower as compared to the first generation solar cell so for new approaches uh, of course we cannot have entirely new approach so what they decide that we can use the second generation approach itself and uh, we can improve the utilization so we can use the complete spectrum we can use better materials that is non toxic and abundant uh, because in thin films we were using toxic materials so you can understand why silicon would be would be good here but for fabrication we let us use the second generation deposition method itself uh, so we have to have high quality material with very low defects so that recombination would be lower and the efficiency would be higher and then most importantly it should be compatible with the large scale because we know that as we uh, increase the size of the panel the cost is also going to go down that is one of the factor for example let me tell you uh, uh, some for 5 10 years back uh, normal available panel was 40 to 100 watt nowadays you will find out about 420 to 600 watt single panel is very common and those are the cheapest one so that's why uh, you uh, panel cost is not uh, the not the absolute cost mentioned however it is mentioned as a per watt cost so one way is to use the complete solar spectrum. So you can see that band gap of uh, the silicon is 1.1 electron volt. And then this is the total spectrum. And most of the uh, photons, either we are, uh, I, I, they are non-absorbed because of the band gap or as the band gap is low uh, and the photon energy is higher we we waste that energy just into heating it so we have to use all these extra energy and for that we can use multi-junction solar cells uh, so we can go on increasing uh, the junctions the efficiency is going to increase further we can concentrate the light so that you don't require large surface area large uh, solar cell area you can confine it to very small area and again you can save the material uh, 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 so that that is how uh, the cost will be saved but there is a limit for how much concentration we can do and how much uh, what you call uh, how much uh, how many junctions we can form more the junctions, the cost will increase and relatively the efficiency will not increase. If you concentrate too much, the temperature will be high and then you require uh, the, the losses because of the increased temperature will be higher and that's why you require additional cooling for that. Okay, so again, uh, in, in whole solar PV, there is an optimization. So as far as silicon is concerned, one of, of course, there are so many ways of uh, uh, having this third uh, so many ways and approaches for making a third generation solar cell. Uh, one of them is a band gap engineering and then the advantage is that silicon can be used, of course, for all the advantages I have already talked about. So, uh, as I've said, the band gap here, when we go below uh, about seven to six nanometers, band gap is inversely proportional to the uh, particle size. And this is what people have reported over the past. So you can see that. Uh, so this nitride and oxide, these are the, uh, what you say, encapsulant over here, Si3N4 or SiO2. So depending upon that, you uh, achieve the uh, achieve the band gap. So in oxide, suppose your pore diameter is, let us say, about one. So your uh, band gap is roughly around two electron, sorry, two electron volts. So you can tune it right from somewhere around 1.12 uh, uh, about two electron volts so with the same silicon or we call it as all silicon solar cell uh, you can make a cell with a different band gap so a cell with multiple junctions let us say three or so and you can tune that uh, uh, band gap you can uh, then optimize what band gap you need require for uh, uh, to to optimize this solar spectrum and you can achieve the maximum efficiency already i have talked about the quantum cross right so this is the one which uh, I formed during my PhD. Uh, so there is a quantum dot layer and then there are top layer of uh, the silicon. So PN junction is formed and in I layer we have put the quantum dots. And uh, the effect I can show you simply is here. Of course, as your band gap changes, the absorption changes, right? So this is for silicon and as we, uh, you know, decrease the 
uh, what you call the particle size, you can see that uh, the uh, as, as the band gap is increasing, it is now absorbing the bluish photons, which are roughly around 400 uh, nanometer or so. And, uh, and uh, so what you can do is you can make one solar cell of this particle size, one here somewhere, okay, and the third one here. So one, then two, and then uh, the third one and uh, collectively the efficiency would be more now because you are using more uh, more, more uh, part of the spectrum of course then there are silicon nanowire based solar cells uh, this we have started recently uh, yet we have to fabricate a cell uh, but just to give the introduction uh, these are the two types of uh, normally solar cells preferred one is the radial junction and one is the one is the axial junction uh, the, and then you can try various things you can use organic inorganic materials you can use the homo junction or hetero junction means the same or different material you can use uh, disensitized material here for coating so that your uh, the flexibility remains and uh, the process is cheaper in this case uh, of course efficiency would be a bit uh, smaller and then you can use the hybrid uh, ones as well so people are people are going after various uh, approaches so in short, this is what happens. So again, the principle of operation is very same. You uh, go for uh, the electron hole pair generations, which happens at the surface of the uh, nanowire. And that's why your surface properties and uh, the length or and diameter uh, is now vital. You can understand over here. And as far as radial is concerned, the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, this is this is the this is the radial. So sun, uh, sun rays will be perpendicular to it, and uh, the junction will be uh, produced somewhere over here. Okay, and uh, when it is axial, your junction is produced in between the nanowires. Uh, so uh, on one nanowire, you are you have to grow other, or you have to change the doping over here, so that. Uh, you uh, you make this uh, what do you say axial junction so these are the two types as far as uh, the uh, parameters are concerned and output is concerned it's very very complex so when we were studying this uh, we found out that the length is a parameter which affects largely every parameter why uh, that is a uh, very complex question to answer but what we found out that uh, the length has to be the, uh, is to be longer uh, for the uh, axial junction but it has to be shorter for a uh, radial junction rather here the diameter is important we should have a smaller diameter as much as possible so right now we were controlling uh, controlling length but slowly we will uh, start also controlling the diameter and then we will start form, forming the devices and what is reported is the radial structures are much better they uh, they give uh, better efficiencies it is because uh, you can see that the distance between the surface and the junction is quite low so the absorption and then separation is quicker and it is uh, what you say uh, the lifetime is much better the carrier collection also happens uh, uh, very efficiently because the junction is very near to the surface but whereas in uh, actually you can see that junction is quite away from the top surface so there is a large chance that the recombination will uh, will take place however uh, the only problem with the radial is that it has got a very uh, it has got a high series resistance for uh, as compared to the axial one so here also there are various properties the density of the nanowires uh, they affect the quantum efficiencies the i layer thickness that is the that will decide where your junction is diameter I already i have talked about when you are going for axial the doping level uh, doping level matters uh, in this case because if you have got a very uh, high doping as i have said it will lead to the more uh, it will lead to the uh, what do you say uh, recombinations and you can see that there is no monotonicity in in here so these arrows in, uh, in indicates for example this one it it says that density uh, when we are increasing the density current density increases first and then decreases and somewhat similar effect happens with almost every every parameter so these are complex these are dependent on each other and of course they are not same so although i have just marked it this is this is only the symbolic right but how much effect that again is a problem and also we know that the fabrication condition itself has got so many parameters to vary so ultimately to find out a simple relation between the four one is is very uh, difficult over here 
So now, uh, so that was one way to improve the efficiencies. The other point is uh, the material usage itself. Now this is a what is a historical graph of uh, uh, the wafer thickness uh, over the year. So ultimate uh, ulti earlier people were using about 400 micrometer th micrometer uh, thick layer, and then they understood that the uh, the photons which are going uh, with a with a longer wavelength which are reaching to the uh, uh, you know uh, other side of the substrate they do not really contribute to the efficiency or if 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 at all it is too less so uh, what they did is uh, they started cutting the thickness of the wafer and you will find out that the moreover now the thickness is uh, uh, thickness is somewhere around 200 to 150 micrometer or so currently it is about 150 micrometer so we have reduced the thickness of the substrate from 400 to 150 that is about 60 percent or percent decrease of course, this has uh, increased the challenges such as handling of this uh, wafer. Now the wafer is quite uh, thin, right? But the efficiencies have increased, uh, sorry, the efficiencies have decreased a bit, but uh, the usage has decreased, uh, ultimately increasing, uh, decreasing the uh, per unit cost of the, wafer, of the wafer. Now the problem is, can we go further than this, further below this 150? So here the challenges are how to make these thin wafers. Now, to give an idea, literally these wafers are like our potato wafers. So if you have done this exercise, if you try to slice potato in a very, very thin wafers, you will find out the wafers will be uh, non-uniform, thickness will be different Okay, at the edges. Uh, then they will not be of the full size. You will find out sometimes small, sometimes uh, thicker, uh, larger wafer and whatnot. So exactly similar problems comes over here. So how to tackle with that? And for that, uh, some uh, groups are studying the transfer techniques of uh, uh, what you say, uh, transfer techniques of uh, either porous silicon or silicon nanowire to a low cost substrate. So we are uh, so we can save this. So we have also started working on that. So uh, there are two ways what we found out. Uh, suppose we have grown silicon nanowires and let us say the application is uh, solar photovoltaics. What we can do is uh, we can peel off those silicon nanowire by gluing. Okay, so you, as the uh, as the film is uh, the, about uh, 30 to 40 micrometer uh, thick, we can peel it off and we have to preserve the nanowires. Other thing is the electro assisted, so anodization we can use and uh, we make porous silicon layer beneath the nanowires and uh, when it is quite uh, high porosity layer, we can lift it off. That because we already know that from our porous silicon fabrication. So this is what happens. This is the first gluing technique. So first part is already known to you. That is the mace method. And then we gluing technique, we attach it with some adhesive layer to the low cost subset. So it can be, let us say plastic, glass. Again, it depends on your solar cell structure. Uh, but these subsets are cheaper as compared to your, uh, what you call uh, the silicon, right? And then we have got electro assisted. So we make a porous silicon and we, we lift it and we, we can put it to some, uh, we can adhere it to some other structures. Uh, and of course, the wafer can be reused. So reusability of the wafer is one parameter. Again, we are not losing that material as well. Okay, so now here you can think that we are going, we, we are trying the substrate with uh, what you say, uh, thickness of about uh, 30 to 40 micrometers and suppose we have nanowires on it uh, the nanowires can be somewhere around uh, 3 to 10 micrometers or so and uh, how much we are transferring we have defined one uh, percentage trl how much length is transferred from the fabricated because we expect that as these are these especially the peeling uh, peeling uh, after the gluing is concerned it is a mechanical uh, lift off Okay, so we we can lose uh, the nanowire length over here. In electro assisted, also we lose it because of the dissolution of the material into the uh, into the electrolyte. So this is the gluing technique. See, so this this process is very laboratory. Anyway, we are approaching one hour. Uh, uh, Professor Jain, how much time we have? I have still left. Hello. Professor Srivastava? Yes, sir. Yeah, how much time I have left? Maybe 10 minutes. Well, actually, you have only uh, one minute left, but we can extend it for a few minutes. Uh, I think we we'll started at 11.40, right? Uh, yeah, yes, sir, we can extend it for 10 minutes, sir. Yeah, fine, thank you. Okay, sir.
Okay, because I have I have more or prepared for one one hour or so. Anyway, yeah, sure, so sir. You can see that on glass we are we are we are transferring the film, and it is very thin. That's why it looks like very transparent. And this is after the transferred uh, uh, transferred uh, film, uh, so you can see that nanowires are uh, still uh, intact. This is the electro assisted technique where we are uh, lifting the film uh, itself so we get a large area as compared large film as compared to the previous one however the problem here is that the nanowire length is quite uh, quite small compared to the previous one uh, so this uh, this was one of the method another method what we have is the sintering uh, sintered porous silicon so already i have talked about uh, that uh, sintering increases the porosity so now you can see with bulk silicon, we have formed the porosity layer. Now these are multi-layer. One is the high porosity layer, normally above 50%. Another one is the low porosity layer over here. Now, as I've said, low, uh, small pores, when we sinter, they merge together and they evaporate, they, they, they vanish, okay? But whereas the high porosity layer, these uh, the porosity increases because now you are merging the pore to become a large pore right so your 50 percent will go about 80 percent or so and you will get a columnar structure over here whereas your lpl is almost the smooth one now from this as a base uh, what you say base uh, uh, base uh, uh, structure we can use this for uh, in in a two ways one is called as the layer transfer process and another one is called as the Eltron, that is the epitaxial layer transfer process. Now it all depends upon when you are going to use your deposition. So in Eltron, we deposit the epi uh, uh, epitaxial layer first. This you can use it with different CVD techniques. And of course, for this, uh, what matters is the quality of your uh, thin film, uh, whatever the, uh, what, what do you say, the, uh, uh, yeah, this the, the, the structure, okay, porous structure, and you grow epi-silicon layer, then you cut this with the anodization or something, so this much only will be remaining, and that is, then you build, uh, then you complete your device. And in the other method, that is layer transfer process, first you transfer that layer to some other substrate, let us say glass substrate, and then you start uh, putting the layers, maybe epitaxial or thin layers, uh, thin films or whatever. So that is the only difference, but to fundamental to that, we need a layer separation in both the methods. So people are, uh, as I've said, many groups are working on that for the last few years. And uh, this is a combined uh, uh, graph of that. So here, uh, the challenge is, of course, a physical challenge, how we can go uh, thinner, okay? So you can see people are reporting somewhere around 50 to 40 micrometer layer or so. But here what happens, the lifetime is the one which is compromised. Uh, for photovoltaic devices, we require larger carrier lifetime and uh, that is that to minority carrier lifetime. So we have to increase the lifetime by uh, what you say, maintaining the quality uh, by reducing the defects uh, in, in here. Apart from that, uh, uh, this uh, application is also reported. Uh, you, we can use multi-layers, uh, the sintered multi-layers. Uh, these are used as a gathering layers. Uh, uh, when, when we fabricate the P plus uh, substrate, there is a high doping and whenever uh, and in, in such a P plus substrate, there, is, there are impurities uh, like the metal impurities, uh, copper, uh, then silver, gold and whatnot, chromium. Now these are here, okay? And this is your device. Of course, you don't want these uh, uh, defects to enter, in, impurities to enter into your device because that is going to uh, work as a trap. So to make a barrier between them, you can see that uh, alternate HPL, LPL layer, that is a multi-layer porous silicon, which is sintered, is used as a, uh, as, as a, as a barrier uh, for that. And it is called as the internal gathering, uh, gathering, gathering layer. Uh, so this, uh, uh, this uh, what you say, improves the mi minority carrier uh, lifetime. Apart from that, we can use such a porous silicon layers for a Bragg reflector. These are for waveguides in antenna and some other optical applications. So these waveguides uh, in, in solar cells also, you can use it for decreasing the reflection on the top. 
So this acts as a mirror basically, and uh, the mirror properties depends on the refractive index, and refractive index depends on what is the porosity and the thickness uh, of 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 the layer what what we have what we have achieved. So this is the graph of. Uh, reflectivity versus wavelength so you can tune where exactly uh, you want high reflectivity and low reflectivity so this acts as a uh, kind of filter uh, filter for us okay so i think uh, yeah i'm i'm well within time so i have finished with the solar photovoltaics as well so here we can take a break and uh, we can continue in the next session with uh, the solar silicon for uh, the hydrogen storage so any quick questions or something uh, so you can please ask thank you sir thank you for such nice informative session uh, we have some questions in the chat box so let us take them one by one uh, so our first question is from uh, ms poonam bhatia and she is asking does the cantilever probe of afm changes the surface morphology of material while moving on the surface yes uh, and that is that is sometimes a problem especially in case of porous silicon um, uh, so of course see if your material is too sturdy then it 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 cannot because uh, you, you know that tip will be very small somewhere in the nanometers so uh, rather it is not expected that uh, you know uh, you do that because the tip will uh, tip will break okay uh, but what happens especially what we have observed in porous silicon is that as the structure is very brittle and if there is a in in case of the uh, what i call it as the physical touching mode uh, in that case uh, when uh, the tip touches uh, uh, the porous silicon uh, it 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 uh, changes the structure and especially these porous silicon films are attached to the substrate so in fact uh, uh, it pushes the films and then the, there is nothing in the scan Uh, so it is very difficult to get a good afm picture of uh, porous silicon film attached to the attached to the substrate absolutely difficult or rather not at all possible when it is a free standing film so yes it changes the surface mor morphology but when you intend to do that that is the another technique uh, that is what i was talking about uh, scanning pro this uh, scanning tunneling microscopy where uh, i think nano indentation and uh, uh, other things are there where you can uh, what at, at nano scales literally at the atom scale you can arrange the atoms and you can achieve the effect you want but uh, we haven't done that so afm is only normally used for measuring the uh, surface morphology and in general generally speaking you should avoid uh, what you say in contact measurement that's why we have got non contact measurement nowadays so where you don't uh, what you say you don't uh, let the material interact with the tip and you save the tip because that is costly thank you so much sir we have another question on afm and uh, the question is Uh, what types of material can be studied by afm and what type cannot be and uh, what other information can be obtained like other than the surface yeah, morphology uh, yeah it depends on the type of afm and all that uh, of course i can't uh, you know elaborate this as of now but uh, uh, depending upon what type of mode uh, you are using whether it is conducting non conducting whether they uh, whether they respond to uh, whether they induce some forces or not uh, so all these things uh, depends uh, you know uh, depends on that so you have to choose material accordingly the availability of the afm so better if somebody one is top uh, talk uh, somebody is trying to do that better you talk with your operator and uh, what is a find out whether your material is suitable for that particular afm Technique or not? Thank you so much, sir. So uh, our next question is for the similar types of application. If we compare the carbon nano dots and silicon nano dots, then uh, which one is better on the basis of their commercial, economical viability, and environmental sustainability? Uh, now, uh, one of the professor with I'm working with uh, at at IIT Kanpur says that whenever you don't have any option, you go for carbon because that is the easiest option. okay so of course carbon has got certain advantages i haven't worked on carbon uh, but yes carbon is uh, another good material to work on because it is uh, cheaper like right? we, we can easily get it uh, but as far as comparative studies concerned we haven't done it yet okay uh, but yes we are thinking of uh, merging silicon and graphene together to take certain advantage over here uh, but as far as performance is concerned uh, i'm sorry i i, I can't comment on that 
and uh, to my knowledge even the applications would be different carbon uh, can be compared for uh, storage uh, but not for other applications like solar photovoltaics i haven't seen uh, carbon nanowires it it can be used for definitely for storage purpose only as far as my knowledge goes and uh, as far as storage uh, hydrogen storage is concerned uh, moreover uh, the uh, hydrogen uptake is very much similar very much similar okay Thank you so much, sir. Because both have got yeah one more one point to add porous yes. silicon uh, and nanowires. Uh, of course, we are controlling the porosity in carbon. Also, we are controlling the porosity. Okay, so these are very parallel materials. Uh, so unless someone gives a breakout, uh, I don't think so. Uh, the real compare, I mean, real distinction can be made. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, so our last question is uh, from the participant. He want to just understand how conversion efficiency of the photovoltaic increases when we are using the uh, silicon nanodots. Yeah, as I've said, there are various parameters. Uh, for example, uh, if if uh, the surface passivation is one thing, so suppose you are using uh, the uh, yeah, what you call uh, axial one, then your uh, junction is very near to the surface. And if you are passivating the surface, uh, the photo, what you say, photon absorption is better. Immediately there is, uh, what you say, separation of the uh, carriers. And then because of the passivation, it doesn't absorb. So, and then it crosses the junction and then the external circuit. So obviously you are, you are using those uh, uh, what you say, uh, spectrum and uh, every electron helper in better way. So that is how you increase the efficiency. You decrease the reflection over here. Uh, then uh, you can, uh, by, by certain doping, you can control the, uh, what you say, resistances. Uh, if uh, you want to re reduce the series resistances, you can decrease the uh, contact resistances by certain doping at the uh, at the coating, and uh, in in by controlling the length, uh, you can you can improve the uh, lifetime. Uh, and uh, what remains is, uh, yeah, I think I think that's all. So so these parameters are so many parameters will be contributing to uh, to it. Okay. However, still uh, uh, to emphasize that nanowires have not surpassed the efficiencies of uh, what you say first generation solar cell. Right now, people are reporting about 12 to 15 percent or so. Uh, people are talking about black silicon, which are necessary necessary the uh, silicon nanowires with zero reflection. So again, you are absorbing every part of the spectrum. So about 12 to 15 percent people have reported. Thank you so much, sir, for such nice elaboration. Uh, now, I request all the participants to please join back again. We are taking a break here. The next session of Professor Kale will be at 2 p.m. So, all are requested to join back again, uh, back again on that time. So, with this, I declare uh, end of the session one for today. Thank you so much, everyone.